Hello, this is Jens Weller from Meeting C++ with an interview um, with Tom Dacos. And we're going to speak a bit about C++ and I'd like to just start with a short introduction. So, Okay, well, my name is John Lakos. I work at Bloomberg in New York City. Uh, I manage a small team of core infrastructure developers and I also help out with the larger infrastructure and R&D uh, development there and in other uh, sites around the world. Um, and I, uh, I also help with the methodology, the process, the training, um, finding good people to come work there. So if you're interested, uh, by all means, get in touch with me. So to get started with uh, C++, I would like to speak about layer semantics, because I know that you gave a talk on this last year, and there's a bunch of other talks like uh, given at CPPCon. And so what is your view on, on the topic about layer semantics? OK, <clears throat> well. The name of the paper was Value Semantics, it ain't about the syntax. And Value Semantics is really about the meaning of, of a certain uh, category of C++ type that tries to represent an external value outside of process. And while most people, when they think of Value Semantics, they think about the syntax, such as the copy constructor, assignment operator, equality comparison, those are all important, but they're syntactic. And so there's a term for that, which is called regular, which means that all of the regular uh, syntactic elements that we normally think about when we're dealing with uh, types that try to approximate a value uh, are there. But even if they're not there, um, it's still possible for a type to be value semantic, provided uh, that it, it keeps one very important property true, which is if two objects of the given type have the same value today and we apply the same salient operation, by salient I mean an operation that is intended to approximate the platonic type that lives outside of process that we're using as our model, then after that operation is applied to both objects, they will again have the same value or they never did. And that is a key property of value semantics. Another way to say this would be, if two objects have the same value, then there does not exist a distinguishing sequence of salient operations that will cause them to no longer have the same value. So that's, in a nutshell, that's what value semantics is to me. Oh, and not every C++ object tries or should try to represent a value. So if you think about something like a scoped guard or a thread pool, they, they have absolutely nothing to do with a platonic ethereal type, and so they are performing a service, and they're really quite different from value types. Yeah, that's, I think that's an important point that value semantics does not mean that everything in C++ is now a value type. It just means that if you can express something as a value, then you probably should do this. Right. So, speaking about mathematics, type theory. Um, you recently did an interview with Alexander Stepanov and Daniel Rose. Yes. And so what was the, for you the, the primary insight of that interview? Well, one of the things that uh, I've been wanting to do for a long time, uh, Alex had written a book called The Elements of Programming back in 2008. And I've been carrying that book around for years, literally trying to get through it. And I would get to about the first page and a half of the first chapter and get stuck. And, and it was probably my fault for not really bearing down and focusing and, and, and really pushing through it. But what I really is, realized was that, that what Alex is saying in his book and what I've been thinking while we come at it from very, very different points of view, his being mathematics and mine being large scale software design uh, and engineering, um, we've arrived and, and stumbled over many of the same observations and come to many of the same conclusions. <clears throat> I think there's a slight difference perhaps in perception as to where the notion of value begins or at least where it's codified. And I think that's a, a minor point compared to the uh, tremendous amount of agreement that we do have. So it was very satisfying to me to read both the first book and then his second book, which is from mathematics. Uh, to generic programming and understand 
how he looks at solving problems. And in Alex's world, he really does focus on the subset of types that do try to represent a value. And he's less concerned with the uh, mechanisms and other kinds of types that are used in much larger systems. Just a few days ago, the C++ committee did meet in Kansas and um, John was there to attend for Bloomberg and also presented two papers. So. Well, one, one paper actually was more of a, a collection of data. The other one was definitely intended to be uh, considered for uh, adoption. Okay. So, so we, could start, we could start with the one that wasn't presented but is available and is on record. That's uh, N4468. And for a long time, people have been questioning exactly when and how to use allocators to improve performance and also to increase interoperability. Um, this particular paper on quantifying allocator strategies, the uh, performance benefits, uh, was created so that people could understand the different dimensions of when to use allocators and when not to. And so um, we, we, we looked at two different allocation strategies, local allocation strategies. One of them is called a um, buffered sequential allocator or in the standard as proposed, uh, it's a monotonic allocator. And the other one is a long running allocator and it's a multi-pool allocator. And in the standard, it's called a multi-pool allocator. And so we looked at with these two strategies and that they can be um, uh, part of the, the container type or they can be passed in through a base class as a polymorphic memory resource. So we looked at the two ways in which they can be supplied to a container. And so we came up with uh, basically the question is, do you or do you not need an allocator? And if you do, what is the appropriate way to give it to the container? And then what strategy should you use? So that was the question. And then the next step was to figure out what are the dimensions that we look at when we're considering which of those five alternatives, because there are five, uh, to take. And it turns out that, that there, the five dimensions needed an acronym. And so we, I came up with this mascot as a duck, and his name is Divluck. And it's a little silly. He looks like Donald Duck. But at least this reminds me that the five dimensions are uh, density, the density of allocations per instruction, variation, which is the variation in memory sizes that is, is being requested, uh, L for locality. In long-running programs, you can have memory diffuse across different subsystems, and so that's an important consideration. U is for utilization, because sometimes uh, you'll have memory that's used and given back and used and given back, and other times, at some point, you'll need all of the memory at once. And then finally, contention. In multi-threaded programs, uh, allocators can, can be used uh, very effectively to reduce contention because each thread has its own allocator. Now, modern global allocators do a fairly good job with contention, but the paper demonstrates on a number of different uh, scenarios, uh, short running and long running, um, what the relative benefits are for using an allocator versus not. Sometimes there's a negative benefit. You shouldn't use it. But often there's a very positive benefit, and especially for long-running programs with regions that are that are uh, uh, focused on and then abandoned, and then you come back and you go away. Uh, if you keep the memory local to those regions, then you get a much a, 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 a less degradation over time. It really is a question of preserving uh, the locality as opposed to allowing it to diffuse throughout the program. So that was the first paper, okay. which we didn't discuss, but I talk about all the time. Yeah. And your second paper? And the other paper was uh, really in its 10th revision. And this is on uh, preconditioned assertions uh, in C++, having a standardized facility to uh, describe at compile time different levels of, of, of uh, preconditioned checking. Now, this is all, the paper was originally designed to be purely a runtime thing so that you could set the level of checking at compile time based on an assertion level build mode to be nothing or almost nothing for production or on for debugging or max, which is like an audit mode, which allows the uh, checking to go beyond the complexity bounds of the contract for the function. So as an example, 
if I had, for example, a lookup function where the precondition was that the uh, container that I'm going to be looking up in is sorted, the cost of confirming that it's sorted is linear, whereas the lookup is logarithmic. So that check would not be performed. Uh, in addition to having a compile time control over how much runtime we want to spend, uh, checking for uh, invalid uh, trusted user inputs, that is somebody calling my function, we also have a mechanism that allows us to say precisely what happens. So the default is it aborts, but you could also throw, you could also spin, uh, you could do whatever you want because there's a, a place, a central place where you can install a callback and that callback can be whatever you want it to be. So this facility is very useful, but then there are other folks who want to create a, uh, a compile time facility possibly even decorating the interface of the functions, saying what is and what isn't allowed. Now, there's a bit of a, a, a problem here because what you can check at compile time and what you can check at runtime, there's some overlap, but basically runtime checks are, are a different beast and compile time checks typically have to do with the type system and runtime checks typically have to do with values that flow through the system. And so, all the papers were presented, we had a nice long discussion, and uh, Bjorn Strustrup himself has said that we are we are on the hook to come up with a unified paper for uh, the pre-meeting mailing for the meeting in October. So we are going to try our best to do that, if it's at all possible. Sounds very interesting. At this year's C++ Now, you presented yesterday a two session long talk about large scale software systems. And you have also written a book about it a few years ago, and you're currently, I know that you're currently working on uh, a new version of it. So I would like to, to know the motivation behind your talk. And Okay. Well, in 1996, a few years ago, I wrote this book called Large Scale C Software Design, which is now in its 20th printing in something like five languages, I believe. Uh, it was very successful because it talks about how you design and build large systems. And one of the most important things that it talks about is avoiding cyclic physical dependencies. Physical dependency could be at compile time, it could be at link time, but either way, it is a dependency. And if something depends on something else, you need that something else in order to compile or link or test or use this particular feature. And so that book, in chapter five of that book, uh, I provided a number of what I call levelization techniques that people can use to untangle their designs. If something depends on something else and then that depends back, that's a cycle. If I have this depending on this and this depends on this and this depends on this, again, I have a cycle. Physical dependencies are transitive. So the main point of the talk yesterday was to talk about what we call levelization techniques for untangling these things, and there are nine of them that were discussed in the book. But since the book was written, um, we, we have a, a number of different uh, uh, things have happened uh, in C++. In particular, we now use callbacks in the form of either functions or functors or even protocols, which are abstract interfaces, and finally concepts. And so there, there's a lot more opportunity for a higher level agent to call back, uh, to be called back from a lower level uh, um, server. Um, so that section was greatly expanded. Uh, and then the second thing I talked about was um, insulation, which is avoiding gratuitous compile time coupling. And you can have total insulation techniques, such as a procedural interface or an abstract interface, or what people call the um, pointed to impl or pimple idiom, and those are total insulation techniques because they insulate all of the implementation, whereas there are also, very importantly, partial implementation techniques which allow you to insulate the, the more uh, complex and expensive uh, parts of your, your implementation while still getting the speed of an inline function for the small part that gets executed often. And so between the two of those, that was really chapters five and six of my 1996 book. I have been working since then on a much larger expanded 
version of that book. It's not really the same book because that book was large scale C++ software design. And this series of books, it's actually three, deals with the entire process of development. So the series is large scale C++. And the first book, which I'm getting close to being done with, is a, a process and architecture. The second book is design and implementation. And the third one is verification and testing. And I have been working on this forever. And I give talks on parts of the book. And in the process, the book gets better, but then I have to go back and rewrite it. So it's, it's kind of a, there's a little cycle going on there, but hopefully it'll converge. So um, that was a short interview with um, John Lakers, and thank you for giving the opportunity to you know, express your thoughts and uh, share your wisdom with us on VTC++ and um, thank you for the interview. And thank you for having me.